Welcome to Essentials of Lifespan Development. I'm Mike Mainland. I'm your teacher in this course. I'm going to be narrating this presentation for you. Uh, I'll probably kill the video in just a second. I just wanted to say hi and invite you to this. This will probably I have here headphones recommended. I think if you kind of follow along the PowerPoint and listen to this, hopefully it'll be enjoyable and something that can be kind of a more personal and interactive kind of at least kind of me walking you through it and and adding content as we go and we'll see kind of how it works all right i'm interested to get to know you guys if you guys want to reach out to me and tell me a little bit about yourself um that would be awesome and uh yeah this is my first nipsing class but i'm super excited I, i've taught developmental psychology at conestoga and at uh university of waterloo for the last decade or so so i'm very familiar with the content matter but um, if you guys are having any questions or need help with anything, please let me know. Okay, without further ado, let's get into chapter one. Nice to see you, and uh, let's do this. So at a certain level, developmental psychology is really looking at this idea of psychology and how it's influenced by, by age, how we develop, right? So how we evolve would be how we change over generations. How we develop is how we change within one lifespan developmental psychology teaches that we all develop in relatively the same way but differently and what that means is like there's going to be differences in how soon kids start to, to walk and how when they start to talk when they start to go through puberty when they go through menopause when they go through all these kind of physical stages there's differences but there seems to be an underlying coding that's similar right and we're going to get into all kinds of stuff around is, or am I talking about genetics and biology? Am I talking about, you know, learned behavior, all that kind of stuff, right? But it's interesting to think that like this, when the, when life begins, it's this rapid expansion, this like 250,000 new nerve cells per minute. We see by week four, the brain beginning to emerge and these neurons beginning to take specialized tax, tasks. That just means that like the actual cells and the neurons are actually starting to do specific things that we would you know down the road recognize as brain related activity before birth the genes are mainly di directing brain development okay so and that that would make complete sense right so that's just saying like there's very little effect of outside environment now that's not saying especially mom's environment doesn't affect the baby which it obviously does but that a lot of how, if you see that on the right there, the pictures of how the brain's developing as we move through um, pregnancy, you can see that that's almost like a pre-programmed genetic development, right? And we're going to talk about in this course kind of ways people have thought of child development and how, how we basically change with age. And then the role that genetics plays in that, the role that kind of social, social and cultural factors play in that. And kind of the whole kind of complicated dynamic there. All right, we have over a billion nerve cells created by the time of birth. And this is just kind of a, an introductory slide to kind of push this idea of what do I mean by developmental? Developmental is really talking about how it goes from three weeks to newborn. And then how you go from newborn to five or two. And then how you go from two to five. And then how you go to from five to 12. And how being 12 is totally different in terms of identity and self-esteem than when you're 17 or when you're 35 or when you're 40 like me or when you're 70 and how age plays a role as a variable. So when we're talking about human development, I wanted to just kind of start with some key kind of philosophical perspectives. The first one is that human development is lifelong. And as we get into this course, this will make more sense. And I'll talk about how for a long time, people that were interested in, in child development were really kind of interested in how we go from zero to 18. And once we got to 18, you'll see even Freud's model, his psychosexual model that we'll look at, only goes till 18. And it was the work of other people we'll talk about, like Eric Erickson, that really pushed this idea of we need to understand that development is actually a lifelong process and that 30 is a very different experience than being 70, which is something that's obvious. But the literature is now kind of looking at this idea of development's lifelong. We need to look at these strategic, these significant stages and events that people go through in the life course. And it goes from, you know, sometimes you'll hear people refer to developmental psych as 
cradle to the grave. It goes from birth to the end of life. Okay, the next point here, this development that I'm talking about, right? And again, one thing that I, I know you, a lot of you have probably taken psychology courses, so I'm not trying to talk down or anything, but one interesting way to think of psychology is as a language, right? That when we're talking about development, all these kind of terms have a specific meaning within psychology. And here we're talking about how something changes, how something changes biologically, how the brain's size might actually change, how the lung capacity changes, how when kids are going through their quote unquote terrible twos, a lot of that is this massive change in their cardiovascular system that's giving them way more energy before. Some of these changes are cognitive. Some of these changes are in the social or relationship domain. Development is plastic. Okay, so this you'll hear this term in relation to things like if you Google like brain plasticity, which is just a word. Think of what plastic is, right? It's a material that's you can make almost anything out of it. So when someone says that something's plastic, what they really mean is it has a capacity to change. It can change for the better or the worse. People can be traumatized and people can also be healed. Development is contextual, contextual, meaning that a context is like a situation. So contextual means that it happens within an environment. Our families, our schools, our peer groups, our neighbors shape that. It's the nurture side of the nature nurture debate. Development involves growth, maintenance, and regulation of loss. Look at how people develop. We're in developmental psychology really focusing on these kind of three aspects of our experience. The biological processes. So what's going on kind of the other way of saying that is kind of physically and physiologically. What cognitive processes are involved. So what's going on in the mind and then what's also happening in the social and the emotional world. And these three processes or sets of processes are kind of key to what developmental psychology is focused on. Okay, so this first one, biological processes. This is looking at changes in the, of a physical nature. The easiest example of that would be something like puberty. Okay, results from genes, brain development, nutrition, exercise, hormone, age, all these things influence these biological processes. So these are going to be the type of things we're looking at. Like, for example, that first slide I showed was a, of a newborn's brain development that was literally showing the physical brain development. We might look at the role of things like nutrition and exercise and certain hormones on certain aspects of development. That would all be looking at kind of the biological processes. The second level is these cognitive processes, which include things like changes in intelligence and language. So when we get a bit into the course and we talk about guys like Piaget and how he talked about how kids actually as they age, they start to process information completely different. He called these like the cognitive stages of development, which is basically just a way of saying they're like quite literally thinking differently, engaging information differently. And then the last one here is socio-emotional. So obviously that's just the combination of the words social and emotional and how that kind of our social world affects this, how our relationships with others, you know, family, friends, loved ones, how those are, are significant, how our emotions and that whole aspect of how our personality kind of engages the social and emotional world. Okay, so in developmental psychology, we're going to be looking at how all these, when we're talking about these processes that affect us through life, we're kind of, you can kind of subdivide those into biological, cognitive, and social emotional. Now, I should say at a certain point, that's just a theoretical distinction. We're just talking about you. Or we're just talking about humans in general, right? But sometimes it's helpful to kind of break it down. And when we're looking at something like how children behave, to look at what's going on biologically, what's going on at the level of how they're processing information cognitively, and then how is their social and emotional environment shaping things. In developmental psychology, we talk about there being these seven defined periods of human development, right? So it's just, you already know, obviously, that there's like being a, a baby and a, and a young kid and being a teenager, being an adult, being an, a senior citizen. We already kind of have an idea that there's these kind of differences throughout the life cycle. But 
in this next series of about seven slides, well, literally seven slides, we're going to go over these specific kind of, they call it in the textbook, defined periods, but really it's just ways you can break up what we would traditionally call just like a life into kind of sections that we can, that make science, that make kind of scientific and theoretical sense to, to group in these ways. Next slide. So the first of these periods in, in a lot of ways, one of the most interesting of these developmental periods is what we call prenatal. Okay, and you've all heard of this, but prenatal kind of technically was what we're considering from conception all the way to birth. It's a, a period of tremendous growth, all right? And especially in terms of what we're super kind of focused on in this course is brain development. Right, like how the brain is literally, um, well, starting off from cells and differentiating into cells that are doing certain things. And some of those cells that are actually becoming brain cells. And it's fascinating how that development actually happens. And that it's one of those things that um, is so regular and normal in our society that it's easy to forget how uh miraculous sort of the whole process is yeah so tremendous growth from a developmental perspective in that period of time um from a single cell to a complete organism it's just one sentence but it's it, that's pretty loaded right so going all the way from a single cell to you know a complete organism what we just call pregnancy um, the chapter that we're going to do next, Biological Beginnings, is going to get deep into this. And if you're kind of interested in, more interested in the biological aspect of this course, you'll find that interesting. Um, and I think I, I want to really look at this idea of how, well, our biological beginnings and how that sort of sets the stage for understanding a lot of the brain development stuff that uh, is coming later. Okay, so first stage, prenatal. The second of these uh, sp defined developmental periods is what we call infancy, All right? So this is a, a term everybody that you'll all know. Infancy just meaning from birth till, you know, some people you'll read it different different places, but basically to a year and a half to two years. So from zero to two is what is considered infancy. Great dependence on primary caregivers hugely important for psychological development we'll get big time into that but this idea that the primary um or how basically the child's forming models of what relationships are in these early stages and so you know these early relationships are are foundational to the social interaction patterns and understanding of self and all these things that are developing in the young child's mind um, we'll spend a lot of time on on those kind of topics. I hope that you find that kind of interesting. Some of the psychological activities we're going to be focusing on related to infancy, the development of language. I personally find that super fascinating. I find one of the most interesting things about humans is this idea that if my daughter had have been for whatever situation, all of a sudden raised in Egypt she would learn how to speak perfect Egyptian and a child in born in Egypt in the exact flip can learn perfect English the amount of adaptability that shows that children are basically able to learn any language and actually some of the re interesting research suggests that as they start to learn languages um, some of those possibilities to go in the other direction start to close up. So all that stuff around language. Language is fascinating. How uh, and how the use of language is directly related to this emerging mind of the child. All right, sorry, I got a little ranty there. Symbolic thought. That's the other thing is like how, what is actually, so a child's not having the same level of 
elaboration and articulation of thought that me and you are having, they're thinking largely symbolically. And what does that even mean? All right, so again, these are kind of like overviews of what's going to be coming when we get into these specific chapters. And then this fact that you'll hear, you may have heard uh, people refer to this as a sensory motor stage or that kids are really sensory motor. You hear that word a lot. And it's a really interesting term because what it's really saying is that a child's processing the world almost entirely through their senses. So what they're seeing, hearing, feeling, touching, tasting, and then their movement. And that that's actually a really psychologically relevant relationship, kind of obviously, but I think the interesting point there is the child is experiencing the world. And if you have, if you've had a child or have like a young sibling or have been around kids, it's like they're touching everything. They're picking up everything. Their, their experience of things is through their senses and through their motion. That's uh, kind of just what sensory motor means. Okay, so the second one, infancy. So after uh, the prenatal stage and infancy, the third stage is childhood. So this is from approximately 2 to 11. This is, uh, I'll probably talk to you quite a bit about this at different stages in the course. Um, I have a daughter myself. So my wife and I have one daughter who, her name's Evelyn, and she's just turned four a couple days ago. And... Uh, yeah, she's the best, but also a, a complete handful in terms of she has just never ending energy. And, you know, with all this COVID stuff, like back in March, I was teaching at the college like full time, like I, I still am and I have been for a long time. And, you know, how life gets so busy and she was spending a lot of her time uh, either at my mom's or at my wife's mom's. So at her grandma's. And, uh, and then when all this COVID stuff happened, I started spending obviously a lot of time at home. And since my wife was doing a lot of Zoom stuff with her work, um, me and Evelyn spent like the entire, like basically the last half a year together. And, uh, now I'm becoming like the sad dad because, uh, my little girl's going back to, my, not back to school. She's going to school for the first time. In a couple days, she's uh, starting school, which to me is completely mind blowing that she's starting school. In my head, she's still like a my little baby. It's so um, yeah, so it's hard for me to not just kind of read my own life in this slide, and that kind of gets to a point about this course is at a certain port point, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about both of us and I'm talking about humans in general. And I think that's the thing that, you know, if I, if I only teach you one class or two classes, I hope I can influence you a little bit that way. It's at a certain point, you know, tests or tests and assignments or whatever, but getting inspired to like actually think of how it kind of bridges, like how, what you experience psychologically and what other people experience psychologically and well what's similar about that and what's unique about your situation and just all the depths of the you know what freud would call psychodynamics awesome word awesome word right the 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 complex inner workings of what we call a mind is uh anyways maybe i'm getting <laughs> Uh, I, I, I already like you nipissing students. I'm, I'm not going to keep apologizing for going deep. I think some of you will like it and you know, I can only be myself. Okay. Uh, school readiness. Like that's crazy. Like that's so key. Right. But I'm just saying it's crazy in terms of my own life. Like I'm still getting my head around that Evie's going to school in two days, but this is, this is a huge thing, right? Because the influences on her now aren't just going to be you know parents and family 
a, there's going to be a lot more of what in the in psychology is sometimes referred to as like a horizontal influence, right? So that just uh, vertical influence would be like parent down to kid. Horizontal would be like kid to kid, like friend to friend. Peer influence starts to become a developmental factor. I'll try not to just rant about my daughter too, too much. I'll try to, I'll try to, you know, give a correct amount of dose of that. Uh, so the second kind of subcomponent of childhood, mid to late childhood, this is uh, where a lot of focus in their kind of day hours is around school, at least theoretically around a lot, a lot of mastery of what we consider kind of basic things, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, school stuff. And I think this is this is kind of the point I'm making here is this the environmental factors influencing the kid are starting to really change, starting to really be kind of says they're formally exposed to a world outside the family and to prevailing culture. This is where. And, and I'm just trying to get my head around what exactly I'm trying to say here. One of the constant themes in this course is going to be where a lot of the influence is coming from. So for I can just be more specific. A two year old. In their interaction with their primary caregiver, like biological mom, not always that case, but let's use that example. That relationship is so important, so dynamic, so overwhelmingly significant compared to other relationships let's say when now let's completely flip examples and say when somebody's like 16 17 and all of a sudden being cool or let's even go a little bit younger say like 15 being cool and being liked at high school the kind of pure that's probably when you would say like maybe i'd say 14 15 is probably when peer pressure and uh, we'd have to get more specific and look at genders and we will when we get to that but just in general is kind of maxing and i think that's true for i think probably a lot of you experienced that that probably when you were most cared the most about what your friends thought about you was probably when you were like mid high school um but then so this is the point right this where this influence is at and for these kids they're in this weird kind of in-between point where they're still heavily influenced by these original or these more um well these more dependent family relationships or these more vertical influences is the term i was using there and now there's the introduction of this horizontal okay you guys are like will you ever get off this slide but uh i got so the next stage then is adolescence, right? So we've done prenatal, uh, infancy, childhood, adolescence. Adolescence from a developmental perspective is, I don't know, maybe the most interesting time. All of these stages are interesting in their own ways. This is when the organism, if you want to take like a far back view of it, the human organism is transitioning from childhood to early adulthood what we call the teen years uh major changes obviously like everything related to puberty and we'll talk about how like how puberty is also like heavily has a huge influence on psychology on especially uh like identity and how the kid sees themselves or how the youth sees themselves uh this rapid physical changes height weight body contour shape sexual characteristics right puberty so there's a physical change that's happening you'll see also on the background on the screen there i have how the prefrontal cortex develop develops late and is kind of only fully uh developed when once they get in, once they get into the early 20s so you'll hear this like referred to often as to why um impulsive behavior and risk taking tends to go down as people get into their mid to later 20s and some of that is because as you get older you get better at weighing risks like yeah doing like a cliff jumping into water sounds like tons of fun but do i want to like risk the sore back for a week and it's like i know that sounds like uh 
my wife would call me like that's like an old man comment but it's like now that i'm like i I shouldn't say 40 i'm only 39 but you know getting close to 40 it's like just the how i weigh risks are way different i can I, i don't need to keep giving personal examples like you can look at how you can just look at like some of the data around how fast people drive as people get a little bit older and get into their mid 20s on in general tend to slow down a bit now nothing slows down people as much as having a child that seems to be uh an interesting that people tend to drive much slower than and that's actually super interesting psychologically i'm really interested in things like that like when you can notice a behavioral change that would have a psychological cause but people might not be aware of why that's the cause right so that's kind of the one of the coolest things about psychology so anyways back to the slide so the adolescent is trying to pursue independence and identity right that's basically what the teenage years are they're trying to be their own person they're trying to figure out who they are right and identity is about who they are and where they fit but it's also about who they aren't and where they don't fit and what behaviors that they do and what behaviors they don't do and you know what they're comfortable with and what they're not and identity is a very interesting thing because in psychology it means something very specific and uh and we'll talk a lot about that we'll talk about how and this is where we're going to get into a little bit of um, some of the work of the cognitive theorists, but how actually the way that information is processed changes, right? So it says they're more logical thought, more ability to think at a level of abstraction and in, in more idealistic ways, not meaning like idealistic in the way we kind of usually use that word, meaning like this person's idealistic, like they're almost like too positive, but idealistic meaning like would it act what that word actually means like being in this abstract level of potentiality right like even me trying to explain that word is a certain level of abstract logical thought and you being able to understand what i'm saying right so like one of the things in the course too and is going to be this kind of constant theme of how do we get to a you know an adult level of ability to process information and that that actually happens in a bit of a sequential you can look at how that develops right and that's where we're going to rely heavily on the work of piaget and what he called the well he just called it uh, his theory of cognitive development right so cognitive development how we learn to think better sorry i don't have that I didn't have that right in front of me. Yeah. And then as the teen and then the teenager obviously is spending way more time outside of the family, right? This emergence of friends as a dominating uh, developmental influence at this stage. But in addition to having said that, it is interesting to note that the research does show that family and some of the earliest influential factors are still actually quite high at this stage. Even though teenagers would probably tell you that they only care about their friends, maybe, or you might think that that's how teenagers are. Um, having grounding in those early relationships, basically family is still a significant developmental factor for good or bad still at this stage um, for a lot of people. Okay, and in this course, we're going to um i'm going to be teaching you this course and i actually just signed the contract so i hope you i hope you guys don't get sick of me too quick because i'm going to do the second part of this in the winter um where we're going to keep going from this so for the purpose of today i am going to just quickly do five six and seven um basically adulthood but in this course for the fall we're really going to focus on basically zero to 18. okay So I'll just do these next couple quick because I'm going to spend way more time in the winter course looking at it. Uh, early adulthood, basically 20s and 30s, 
um, hugely focused on this, you know, becoming becoming your own person, establishing personal economic independence, becoming proficient in a career, uh, starting a career or, or uh, academic development, uh, mate. That's such a cold way of saying it, but this idea of like potentially finding a loved one or not and how and starting certain behavioral patterns and possibly beginning a beginning uh, a family okay so this idea of early adulthood number five number six middle adulthood so this is basically 40 to 60 uh as i mentioned I have about another about 10 months before I switch into this stage. Uh, this expanding personal and social involvement and responsibility. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is a huge influence on the psychological health of people in this stage is their sense of felt connection to the generation coming next. So not to sound lame, but it's like it's psychologically healthy for me to feel like I'm having like a meaningful exchange with you, you know, the, the kind of, if you're 20 right now, you could say like one generation after me who are interested in similar things. And if I can like, I don't know, maybe make you see a certain thing a little different or, you know, have any kind of lasting effect. It's like that actually adds a lot of real value to my life and that that kind of expanding personal and social involvement and responsibility is actually not just that's like actually a key developmental thing right and we'll get into erickson later but his idea is like he called that a, a sense of generativity or that you're actually generating something that matters and then if you don't have that you can be overwhelmed by feelings of stagnation like think of what stagnant water would mean like just like a pond that doesn't have any water flowing in and out and it's just went like almost stale yeah assisting the next generation to become competent mature individuals and achieving kind of and maintaining career satisfaction this is actually the time in life where people tend to report the highest level of satisfaction with work and it kind of makes sense because it's like you're not and that's obviously going to be dependent on like how how hard you worked up into that point and if, if you kind of set yourself up for um it's kind of like what i said on the last slide like what the dues people pay in their 20s have a huge effect on sh setting up the rest of their life especially when you consider uh, especially if you're talking like specifically about work life Okay, so I'll get way more into that in the next course um, if, if you're interested. Well, assuming you're interested, it's super fascinating looking at how all this stuff relates to adulthood. And then the last um, stage in this is uh, late adulthood. All right, so we're referring to late adulthood, I guess, is just anything past 60 retirement um life review retirement adjustments and new roles and, and involving decreasing strength and health so what we're going to be talking about there life review is an interesting concept right so it's this idea of at this stage what provides a lot of um what's a really important variable in terms of psychological health and again i'm referring to the work of eric erickson uh, who's a really interesting person who we'll talk a lot about. Um, I think I have a little piece more coming on him in, in this uh, specific presentation, but he talked about how later in life, in this last stage, what's super important psychologically for people is being able to look back over the life they lived and have a sense of integrity, true, real, authentic integrity. And he said that, what that meant is like being able to look back over your life and feel, well, basically feel a sense of pride and a sense of you did what you wanted to do. And he said that if people can't do that, they can be left with feelings of despair. And uh, 
you know, wishing they had it done different when they're at a point where they can't change it. And so to Erickson, being able to look back over your life with integrity is was of ultimate, not of ultimate value, but of tremendous value. So actually, I, with my Conestoga students, I often will have that as a test question. Because um, the one way I didn't, one of the assignments with them was uh, I'd give them like a bunch of questions and they could pick a few of them and they had like a week to do it. And one of the questions was, well, let's put this into practice, right? Erickson says that when you're older and you're in this last stage, you're going to look back over your life and you're going to, whether you can do that with integrity or not, is going to be a key factor in determining your psychological health. So how can you start living now in a way to increase your chances that later you can look back at your life with integrity? And I actually think that's an awesome way to view things. How can you, and you know, maybe if you're say 20 years old right now, it'd be more meaningful for me to say something like, if you're 20, maybe try to live as if you're trying to make the 40 year old you proud of you. And that that's actually, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a good orienting philosophy. Okay. So in developmental psychology, there's kind of like four ways. It says four ways of conceptualizing age, but kind of like four ways of talking about age. We can talk about age in just the normal way, sort of, eight uh, years since birth. This kid's 10 years old, maybe the, assuming that's his dad in the picture, maybe is uh, 32, and maybe the grandpa is uh, 64. That'd be chronological age. Biological age, age in terms of biological health. So this would be, so some of these are kind of, adding a variable so this is like saying like adjusting an age based on like for example heart conditions and stuff like that so basically the idea of like well there's a big difference between two 70 year olds if one has uh significant health issues and the other doesn't so age isn't just chronological age psychological age like how adaptive the capacities are um in terms of both mental sharpness and ability to have resiliency and all those kind of important interactive uh, or I mean interpersonal social skills and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it says adaptive capacities compared with those of other people, their same chronological age, right? And you'll hear people say that in common speech all the time. Like my grandma's 91, but for her age, she's really sharp. Well, that's just, a kind of less technical a way of saying that like or acknowledging that just think about how people say that right it's kind of like acknowledging both chronological age and psychological age and sort of biological age to all in that and social age right so this is connectedness with others in the social roles that individuals adopt and it's like i can you know, maybe that same example I used of like your grandma, that's like not your typical grandma because she still acts like she's younger. It's like she has a social age that's younger than her chronological age. Again, this is just kind of ways of talking about it. So in this first chapter, it talks about how there's these like three, they call it three patterns of aging. Um, and just to kind of give the little heads up. So it's basically like there's normal, there's uh, not normal in like a negative sense, and there's not normal in like a positive sense, right? So they just call it normal, pathological, and successful. So the first one here, normal, that most individuals uh, for whom psychological functioning often peaks early in middle age, uh, that psychological functioning tends to stay relatively stable until they get into their late 50s, early 60s, remember we're talking here about psychological function, tend to have modest, which means like not super dramatic, but kind of modestly steady decline through the early 80s. 
All right, marked decline can occur as individuals near death. So what that means is oftentimes it's it's you see somebody and you know just uh, without getting uh, too deep into it, like I could just use the example of my grandma who is a super p close person in my life. Uh, had that idea of kind of marked decline or like was getting worse but got like really worse the last like few weeks or whatever so that's what that means marked decline can occur as individuals get close to those last days and you know just as a side note this kind of came up i wasn't expecting to even talk about this right now but in the next course um the kind of logical conclusion to this course and that course combined is to spend time at the end talking about while well, talking about death dying and bereavement i think is literally the name of the chapter and i think that's you know to say it bluntly what would it be about that eventually we need to address this topic of um the end of the life course right now I'll, I'll try to do that in a way that's sensitive but also deep um so yeah anyways that's that's a discussion for a different day so next so in developmental psychology pathological refers to basically when it's not the average when it's not like what you would consider normal and the way that it's not normal is in a way that you could without sounding super value judgy um, that you would kind of call negative right like n worse than average individuals who show greater than average decline okay so people that you would say like almost it's almost like they're aging early right it's almost like maybe they have the cognitive decline of somebody that's 85 and they're 72 this cognitive this impairment is often probably affecting them cognitively so the example would be like as you can see in the image i use there somebody with early onset alzheimer's you would absolutely call that a pathological or having a, at least a pathological component um yeah and i i'm going to be sensitive when i talk about alzheimer's i know a lot of you probably have had a family member um at least one influenced by alzheimer's and i certainly have two and alzheimer's research is really interesting and it's i heard someone say at a conference once this was years ago it was like the person was making a point and what they were saying is like if humans figure out a way to stay alive longer this is kind of interesting kind of side rant but so say if because really to stay alive longer we would have to solve three mysteries right how to keep the heart alive how to keep the lungs alive and how to keep the brain alive at a certain point those are those are the and now you know they're even starting to do things like obviously heart transplants already but the guy's point was if everybody could say theoretically i know you guys are probably wondering like what rabbit hole i'm going down here but the point was if everyone could stay alive to 150 would everyone get alzheimer's and is alzheimer's really becoming this is it really growing and becoming a bigger thing now or is it just that people are living longer so this brain um or what should i say neural decline is actually just what happens when people live that long and it was i remember thinking just that idea i can't even remember if it was like a prof or if it was a student that said it or and i remember just getting hit with that idea of how interesting the emergence of alzheimer's is a very serious thing that is affecting a lot of us at an individual family thing and the fact that humans are living longer um now than before how those two things are connected So then the flip of pathological aging would be what is referred to as successful aging right which is kind of self-explanatory it's it's when there's this kind of co combination of positive i have here positive 
uh, physical, cognitive, and soci social, emotional, so kind of social and emotional development, is maintained longer, right? So I thought this was kind of interesting. This was by Rowan Kahn back in 19, 1998. It's kind of an older model, but this it's, it's simple, but it's, it's also interesting. It's like they look at successful aging as being this three-part thing that includes the absence of disease and disability. So to a certain point, uh, that's like the physical part, that there's still high cognitive and physical function and this kind of social engagement piece is still important and some of you at some point in your life might be working supporting older people right working in a potentially in like a senior's home or maybe you're gonna in the future be doing kind of uh rehabs kind of physical training that'd be more kind of what my students at conestoga would be doing uh, you might be doing social work counseling with people that are older. You might be doing uh, personal support work. Actually, I don't know if any of you are doing that. I know some of you are taking the social work route. So the, the and the fact that Canada, here's another interesting point, sort of. Canada has a very aging population and it's going to be a huge upcoming um there's going to be a lot of demand for people doing support services for the senior populations in Canada. And that's significant information for a lot of you entering these fields, right? So it's just, a, it's just something to think about. It might be a, a, a source of an interesting place for you to consider. Um, and, and if you were to consider that kind of stuff, being taking this kind of perspective is interesting, right? How can you actually foster people to have more healthy final years? It's it's actually a, a really and how can you use ideas from psychology to to do that? Okay. So you've probably come across this term of nature versus nurture. And I wanted to present this here because this is going to be something we're going to talk about throughout the term. And this is just an image I got off Google. It's not, I'm not really going to talk about this in terms of a debate. I think the debate on this is long over. I think it's a complex combination of nature and nurture in almost every situation, right? So nature, basically, I'll just read this definition because I thought this actually, this definition was pretty good. That our genetics determine our behavior. At a basic level, a nature explanation for things or a biological explanation or a genetic explanation are all kind of the same. That Those would all be on the same side. That's all like a nature way of looking at it. Whereas if somebody's saying like, oh, it was how they were raised or how um, their environment shaped it, not who they were. Right. So in a lot of situations um and and why i'm saying this is because we're obviously both right you're a complex organism called the human being well more specifically called the homo sapien sapien right um but you're also living in a social world that has a lot of influences on you right and whether we call that social world an environment or whether we call it nurture Right, so think of nurture, that means like how, well, it's another word for parenting. It's almost like the world is parenting us. And I think that nature nurtures is a useful way of looking at things because really it's almost just a different way of saying like that there's a biological side and then like a social influence side or like there's the influence of who we are at a physical material genetic programming level. biological level right so this comes up in a lot of different ways but at a certain point if someone's saying nature nurture they're, they're talking about the difference between you know is okay let me just give a more tangible or a more like real example it's like say i have an issue with anger is that because my dad did and his dad did and it's genetic like that or is it because 
I grew up seeing my dad have anger issues and it was like exposure to it and it's like nurture. Now that was a weird example because that's actually that's actually a decent example I guess because that's a scenario where it would be complex in both scenarios because actually in men anger does tend to run in hereditary lines but in the same sense <clears throat> being modeled aggressive behavior also affects tendencies towards aggressive behavior so again it's like at a certain point it's not one or the other it's a complex combination of both and uh yeah we'll explore that in, in relation to tons of different topics i kind of just freestyled that example but we'll get into specifics where where this is relevant slight i i was ranting a bit but this is just saying it uh, a little more succinctly nature and nurture is really looking at the extent to which development is influenced by uh by those two factors by nature and nurture by uh biology and environment basically so nature can be defined as an organism's biological inheritance right now that inheritance is gonna is uh from the parents right but also from the ancestors right because nature um, like genetics you you inherited much more than just your parents you you come from a long line of humans and then nurture referring to environmental experiences like how our the world that we live in has shaped us right so one way uh this nature nurture the idea comes up a lot is when we talk about how things either stay stable or change right so how and sometimes those are both interesting like why certain things in our life changes as we age and why certain things stay relatively the same and what is that right i, I have down there um how it how canadians have grown right so it says they're the average height of a canadian female in 1914 was basically 5 2 and in 2014 is 5 4. now that's an interesting developmental fact right there's you don't have to have any theory to explain that that's that's a statistical average right but if we are going to try to explain that there's kind of two ways you could explain that Right? Do you think that there's like a genetic reason for that, or is it environmental, and 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 what's the difference? Right, and this is where we're going to get into some complex things, like around an idea called epigenetics, which is like how can our lived experience actually affect us at a genetic level, right? And how can those two things kind of interact? And I'll I'll, I'll share some cool examples of that uh, when we get to that point. All right, so this is sometimes used to explain also what's called continuity and discontinuity. Because you just think of the word continuity meaning to like continue, right? It's like, do you continue doing the same thing, right? So continuity and stability are related words and change and discontinuity are kind of related words. And then this is another uh, term that you, you've maybe come across already if you're um taking like a statistics course so quantitative means statistics basically so when i say uh in the 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 average height of a female in canada changed between 1914 and 2014 that's quantitative right like i'm giving you a number i'm saying actually the change was from 157.6 centimeters on average to 163.9 centimeters on average that would be quantitative data if i said something like what it what the experience is like of being a woman in canada what the let me get even more specific let's say like what is it like to be like a single 20 year old canadian woman in i just keep using that date because well i think just a lot of you are roughly that age right so what's it like being a canadian uh woman who's 20 now 
or a hundred years ago? Well, that question is going to be harder to put like a specific number on, but it's definitely different. There's and the difference. So the term for that is it's a qualitative difference. And so quantitative, a kind of simple way to remember it is quanti quantitative. The word in there that's hidden is quantity and quantity means number. Where in qualitative, it's like the quality. It means like the the actual nature of it's different. And that's why I have the word identity. It's like, what does identity mean to a three-year-old? And what does it mean to a 16-year-old? You, you could definitely make an argument that it has a significant psychological influence on both, but in very different ways. In, just to use this term, in qualitatively different ways. Whereas... The height between a two and a 16 year old is different quantitatively. So again, I hope that wasn't, uh, you might already know that distinction, but I just tried to hopefully make that clear with an example. Okay, next slide. So I just added this to go just a little bit deeper on that. So where you see this qualitative, quantitative use of terms oftentimes is in a research context. So say, uh, and maybe I'll show you if if you if you are interested in this, um, I can show you this at some point. But I did my master's thesis as a quantitative study, so I was interested in uh, martial arts as my area of research interest. So I was interested in uh, some of the psychological benefits people get from martial art participation. I did like survey research where I had like I had 183 people from like 16 different martial art clubs in the Kitchener area fill out these surveys and I, I did like a stats kind of thing but then for my so that would be considered uh, quantitative structured data collection statistical analysis trying to find objective conclusions using surveys or, or experiments um, mine was a survey but then in my uh, PhD uh, research study I did qualitative research, right? Basically, uh, interview and, and video data collection, also about martial arts. So maybe I'll tell you that story someday. But yeah, it's uh, so there. There are two different ways of doing it, right? Quantitative is more for focused on numerical data. Qualitative, more on well, it says here unstructured data. Maybe that's a good way to say it. So this is just, I know you, you definitely know what the word theory means, but in psychology, I, and I think it just, it's, it's useful uh, having in our notes like this very specific definition of it, right? That a theory is an interrelated, coherent set of, set of ideas to explain a phenomena or make a prediction, right? So you have a theory about something. So, so here's an example. So bystander effects. So this is the idea that like, people are more likely to actually help somebody if it's a situation where it's just them than if they're in a group because when they're in a group um there's what's called a diffusion of responsibility so it's like everybody feels like somebody else is going to do it they feel less personally responsible right so that's an idea that's a theory there's some interrelated interrelated ideas there that are used to explain a situation that happens, so why that happens, and and actually make predictions about future instances where that could happen. So the whole kind of scientific method that kind of Western knowledge is based on is based on this idea of theory and theory testing and trying to falsify theories, right? Not, which is the opposite of what you could call like verificationism. So what that would mean is like verificationism would just be like only looking for information that proves your point or being like biased or being in your own echo chamber or whatever, right? So this idea is that what real science is, is you have an idea and you try to prove it wrong. You try to falsify it. And if you can't falsify it, then it's a working theory. You know, that you start with a hypothesis where there have there's certain hypothesis is just a and you know 
classically you've probably heard a hypothesis called the educated guess it's like you've been thinking a lot about something and you have an idea that idea has certain assertions or certain i it's like uh an assertion is like part of the idea it's like i think this 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 and this therefore this is my hypothesis when you said this 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 and this those are assertions right i'm just getting a little bit technical here but and that the, it has some prediction of something else. So like that bystander effect, it's like, I explain that idea. It would predict, you know, depending on who's around you, it would have a different kind of predicted effect of your, your upcoming future behavior. So again, I know I'm being a bit rambly here. What I'm really trying to say is Science and research in general is based on this idea of the scientific method. And what that really means is just basically how to try to prevent ourselves from being biased as much as possible. And the way to do that isn't to try to prove our ideas right. It's actually kind of counterintuitively, counterintuitively, or meaning like not obviously. It's actually to try to focus on proving them wrong, right? So what we do is... We start by conceptualizing a process or a problem to be studied. We have an idea. Then we collect information about it, analyze that information, try to, in the analyzing, that's where we kind of would insert that falsification principle, right, of trying to figure out, is there other ways that can explain this? Are we actually looking at this right? Am I seeing this wrong? And then maybe drawing conclusions from that. Okay. Okay. And here's that kind of confusing rant I just did in a much clear, more clear uh, image format. So just a quick side note. I hope you're, I hope you're digging this and, and we're at about an hour in. Uh, I'm on slide 22 of 56. So, uh, and it's about one at night on Wednesday. So I think I'm about to call it pretty soon and uh, I have my whole day tomorrow uh, ready for this. So I think I'm going to get up in the morning and finish this off, but uh, I'm just going to relax for a bit now. But yeah, I just wanted to also say like it's I uh, I'm going to get back to everybody. If you guys if you all email me and um, or reach out at any time, I'll, I'll always be getting back. Uh, just so you know, though, a little bit about my current situation. Um, so I'm teaching full time at Conestoga and my schedule is very front heavy. So a lot of my teaching is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I actually don't teach there on Thursday or Friday. So all my classes are at the beginning of the week. So what my plan is with this is to kind of get ready throughout the week for this. And then Wednesday night, start my process, Thursday morning record, and then just kind of depending, hopefully the file renders nicely. And if it's going to later at night, you know, I'm probably like you know struggling a bit with computer stuff but i think this is all going to be smooth and uh, the reason i was saying that is just to kind of explain like um why i'm kind of aiming at putting stuff out thursday and also why if um if there's like a i'm going to try to be as quick as i can on email but if there's a bit of delay it's probably because i'm kind of being pulled in a few directions and again this is week one so my role at conestoga i'm the coordinator there so I teach classes, but I'm also coordinating the program. So it's just a kind of busy first week. And uh, But once we get into the flow of this and get two or three weeks in, I'm actually really excited. I'm already feeling like more confident than even when I started this presentation. It's weird. I'm really having to get used to uh, presenting to this microphone and not to students in the classroom. But... Um, and you know what, the thing that's made me the most more comfortable, the most more comfortable is, has been the interaction that I've, the, you know, even the little interaction that we've already had. And the fact that a bunch of you um, sent me emails and told me a little bit about yourself and just the general vibe I've gotten from my interaction with all of you as like a student group has been very positive. And so I'm like, and some of you have had questions and technical questions, and, and that's always the case, and that's um, expected and not a problem at all. But uh, I really love, like,
hearing a little bit about who you are and stuff and and i'm gonna maybe try to think of other ways to do more of that moving forward but anyways this would be a good time i think this is a natural pause um if you wanted to take a pause and uh take a quick break or i think i heard someone say that at nipsing they're encouraging teachers to make like hour videos and a couple of them uh i don't know i think like you guys all know how to just pause the video right like it I don't think we need to make it more complicated than it needs to be. I think I'm just going to make a long video and uh, and then you guys just pause it and if you if you want to watch it in segments. And uh, if any of you have issues with that, then let me know and I'll maybe change. But um, to me, it just makes more sense to do it as, as one big video. OK, so anyways, um, next slide. Oh yeah, Freud. Um, I was just talking before about how like interacting with with all of you a bit um, has helped me, you know, even just in the very first lecture, feel a bit more confident. Same with having Freud's picture show up here. Like, it just makes me think a little bit like when I was the same age as a lot of you, like twenty or so starting to go to university and uh, I really threw myself into some of these writers and I think engaging some of these like I would encourage you to at some point in your life read the interpretation of dreams and you know maybe even more importantly read like a book like uh, memories and dreams memories dreams and reflections by Carl Jung or read Freud's uh, Society and Its Discontent. And read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. We might actually do that next term in our class together. Um, and some of these psychologists' actual writings. And I would encourage you like, to, to do more than just read the blurbs in these textbooks. Because they'll, they'll present Freud and then they'll present eight other people. And they'll present Freud's idea on the same plane as those eight other people. And totally, like Freud was a giant of a thinker. Freud was on, and this is my opinion, but Freud is on like the the Shakespeare level of how much he influenced Western culture. Um, and, well, psychology specifically. Usually when you hear people talk about like the founders of psychology, they usually refer to Freud. Now, um, he wasn't the first to use the word psychologist. He he really popularized psychology and and pushed it a lot towards a more kind of bridged the gap between philosophy and, and it's starting to be viewed as more of a science. Um, the only reason I'm hesitating t about straight up calling Freud the father of psychology, although he totally is, like. The other person that has some claim to that would be William James. Another person, like, um, if, you, if you're keeping notes of a potential reading list for your future life, like, uh, sorry, that's a weird way of saying it, but I would say take a note on this, like, Varieties of Religious Experiences by William James was a book written over 100 years ago that, in my personal opinion, is probably still... Yeah, some of the, the more current work by a guy named Bruce Lipton is pretty awesome, like the biology of belief. But I would say that William James is still, first of all, he's fascinating. He has a two-part book called uh, Principles of Psychology, that it's an absolute classic. Um, but what I was going to say is that that book, um, Varieties of Religious Experience, experiences is probably the best attempt to address the whole topic of spirituality at a real deep psychological level like not just in a kind of new agey way but like william james another real intellectual giant and, and uh yeah like as you can probably tell, I'm a, a fan of Freud. I think Freud is 
one of the most misrepresented people, not just in psych, definitely in psychology, but in popular culture in general. You know, Freud's a guy that had so many influential ideas that it's almost like I've heard people say the only thing people remember about Freud is like his his couple of bad ideas because like his good ideas are just what we call psychology now right this idea that we have an unconscious mind that like a lot of who you're attracted to or what you like or what you're repulsed by or what makes you feel comfortable or things that you couldn't necessarily explain to me if I gave you all the time in the world they're not necessarily things you could articulate they're things that are happening at a level that of experience that are a level of processing i should say that is not conscious to you and that that's happening that's affecting all kinds of stuff and that you're actually a lot less conscious of everything that's affecting you and how you're responding to things in your emotional state and all that than you think you are you're not steering the ship as much as you'd like to think and if you take that comment seriously there's a terrifyingness almost to it and Freud from very deep right and his and and Freud's most famous student Carl Jung and we'll get to maybe at some point because they had a, a quite famous splitting but you know two two of the absolute giants of psychology um maybe I should save that for another day but yeah get me started sometime on on Freud and Jung Okay, theories of developmental psychology. So now we're going to do just a kind of quick overview of some of the main voices we're going to hear in this course. Yeah, so, and I'm not sure, and I should have asked this, I should have done like a little poll or something, because I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much, how many psychology classes you have taken, um, as like all your different students have taken. Um, I'm sure some of you have taken an intro psychology course um, and some of you if, if you're uh, recently from high school probably took like a civ class where a civics class where you studied like maybe like a psych a psychology anthropology sociology kind of thing but anyways um, you don't have to dig around in psychology too long but until you come to Freud and the psychoanalysts okay so psycho the psychoanalytic theory is the work of Freud um, and then also his followers so one way I like to describe this is like you just view the word psycho as like the beginning of the word psychology and then analytic they're, they're really trying to analyze what's going on in the mind and it's important to remember like Freud was a medical doctor right like he didn't start his career calling himself a psychologist he was meeting with all these people that were explaining symptoms that at the time were labeled in this kind of dated word hysteria which you would now consider you know different types of mental health conditions and Freud was trying to treat them as a doctor and realizing like there seems to be more going on with this person than is apparently visible now if you're looking at the video right now you can see I have an image there of the tree above water and the reflection of it that's way bigger below and sometimes you'll see Freud depicted with the iceberg right where like part of the icebergs above water and that represents the conscious mind and then the huge part of it that's underwater represents the unconscious and these well unconscious processes heavily influenced by emotion the psychoanalytic theorists like Freud and you know Sigmund Freud being the most famous and his daughter Anna Freud another major uh, psychoanalytic thinker Eric Erickson who I've already talked about today in relation to integrity and um, his whole psychosocial model that we'll talk about a lot in this course he was a psychoanalyst he actually got his own therapy. Eric Erickson, is, this is a kind of fascinating point that I think I have on a slide coming up, but he uh, had went to therapy himself and 
got so much from it, from the experience that he dedicated his life to basically psychology. Um, he didn't even have an undergrad degree and he eventually was lecturing at both Harvard and Yale. Uh, so that's a pretty impressive resume. So in psychoanalytic theory, it's thought that the true understanding of development requires an analysis of the symbolic meanings of behavior, right? What, what these behaviors that we're seeing in people might be reflecting about this deep unconscious world, the deep workings of the mind, these layers of mind. And that's, that's really the take home message about Freud. Love him or hate him, support him or want to rip him down. You have to contend with the fact that there's an unconscious mind. Every psychologist that came after Freud was in a way responding to Freud. And as, as we kind of get to know each other better and as we get going, I'll, I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. But, right, so like F Freud was, it's really hard to conceptualize what, how people viewed Freud at the time, especially at like the height of his fame I'm talking right now, because intellectuals right now aren't really viewed like that. Um to say he was like a rock star would almost be like an understatement. Um, to say he had almost a cultish following, there'd be some truth to that. Not saying he himself was like a cult leader, but he was the father of, you know, when people say he's like the father of psychology, there's, there's definite truth to that. It, and this whole like Vienna, uh, because that's where he's from, like the Vienna School of Psychoanalysis and like his followers and then how those people all, and I, I'm, I forgot to mention before some other really big ones like Eric Fromm and and we can talk about that. I don't know how interested um, you are as a group in like the history of the actual people, but I've always thought that that's key. To me, when I'm reading the theory of somebody, it's like, who said it matters to me. I think, like, if you know who Freud was, who Freud, what Freud was like, and what his relationship with Carl Jung was like, and how understanding that relationship actually lets you understand who they were better, and understanding who Viktor Frankl was is important to understanding, like, understanding that he basically came up with his idea of logotherapy while being a prisoner in Auschwitz, that's significant. And it, it makes it a lot different than just reading like a definition of what logotherapy is from a textbook. Knowing who Carl Jung, I said Carl Jung already, knowing who Carl Rogers was. And how, if you've ever heard anything called person-centered or client-centered, that's his influence. Right, And his whole main thing was, uh, and anyone that's interested in kind of more therapeutic psychology will be interested in him. Because his whole point was... Oh, it's great that you have your theories about how to help people, but if you can't establish real human relationships based on trust and what he would call like uh, unconditional positive regard, which means I don't necessarily agree with everything you say or like everything you say, but I respect your essence as a human being and that me engaging in a relationship with you like that is actually what is therapeutic more than any specific technique and it's the role of the therapist to use themselves as a tool so again like i'm hardcore off the point of this slide um but the point i'm making is i think understanding who these people are that had these ideas i just think if if, if we don't focus at least a little bit of time on that it robs a lot of meaning from the course. So, so I'm going to do that. Okay. Next slide. Sorry. I don't know. Maybe if uh, you can get annoyed at me saying next slide, I don't know how to ask the transition though. Maybe I'll think of something cooler to say. 
Okay, here we go. So before we move on and, and start to look at some of these other incredibly influential um, voices in this emerging field of developmental psychology, I think it's important to spend a second and just look at this picture and really kind of think about what it means, this idea of the unconscious that I've been touching on and that is so core to understanding what psychology is. And I love that picture so much of the classic Freudian iceberg to represent how the unconscious is what's underneath the waves, right? And it's, it's these old emotions and his student later, Carl Jung would go on to call them complexes. So that people have complexes and what that word means is like, it's a complex. It's, it's, it's not language that's used commonly right now, but, um, and again, just because stuff isn't commonly used now doesn't mean that all these ideas have been like discredited or anything. Um, a lot of people that would casually disregard someone like, for example, Carl Jung don't understand his ideas at all. That idea of complexes is super interesting, super smart. He's basically saying that there's these negative experiences that we might have in life get saved in some kind of complex, energetic influence that lives in the unconscious and but affects us in our real life right through through anxiety through um basically psychological tension distress that's the word i was looking for distress right so what does distress mean it means like the opposite of calm like you'll hear like the the princess in distress that means like the princess who's in trouble sorry that's like the only example i could think of for explaining that word um but i think it's what his point is is that it's just because we don't have like a super fancy label for it although a complex is a pretty good label um and just because it's a dynamic that is hard to pin down that doesn't mean it's not true and if you i don't know if you're interested at all but i'm a huge fan of carl jung and i think in some ways i would probably consider carl jung and Anne rand my two biggest intellectual influences i'd probably have to put nietzsche on there too but it's like i don't know if how interested aristotle i don't know how interested um, you are in this so again like I don't it'd be cool for me if there's certain things I touch on and you're like uh shoot me an email and be like Mike can you go more into this or something um so I can direct my rants a little bit towards your interest areas would be cool okay but anyways it's like my point here is that this contribution of the idea of the unconscious to the conversation is not a small thing it might be the most foundational thing at the core of what psychology even is So the next major uh, developmental psychologist or someone who would in hindsight be considered a developmental psychologist was Eric Erickson. So Eric Erickson trained in, psychoanal in psychoanalysis. So he's coming from the Freud uh, lineage. And in some ways, he's probably one of the most famous of Freud's students. Maybe like you'd have to put in front of him, obviously, Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, who is another giant in psychology. And then and then Carl Jung and. Um, and then probably Erickson, like Erickson's has an incredible relevance for, he wasn't as direct of a student, but he was a close acquaintance with Freud's daughter. That's pretty interesting, right? So Erickson though is one of the most important voices in the kind of branch of psychology that now in hindsight we would call developmental psychology, right? Some of these subdivisions of psychology are relatively recent label wise right but they're, they're, i'm trying and i'm going to try to throughout this course highlight how although we're going to be talking about ideas related to certain times in the lifespan that these are these ideas are being contributed from theoretical foundations that are more than just that contribution if that doesn't what i mean by that is someone like freud wrote about all kinds of things not just child development and understanding who freud is helps 
understand what like if you know who Freud is then when you're later on the test and, and you're getting asked some question about you know who said this or whatever it wouldn't have made sense for Freud to say certain things right it would make sense for Freud to be very interested in the inner workings of the person's mind and it wouldn't be like him to say like behavior is shaped entirely just by reinforcements that's something Skinner would say and who was Skinner I'm getting ahead of myself but it's like I think even just from a memory perspective understanding who these people are will it broadens the story in uh, my Conestoga classes I teach about uh, test preparation and stuff it's like it's increasing the memory pegs it's increasing the the likelihood of you remembering this later because you're adding dimensions and layers to the story it's becoming a more complex memory all right so Erickson I'll just do this quick this is just a kind of cool image if you're wondering what those like scanner looking uh, squares are on these is whenever I'm taking an image off uh, that's not basically uh, one of my own or from the textbook publisher it, the image will have that it's just a quick QR source code to where I got the image for uh, copyright reasons anyways I went too much into that so Erickson was a German born American developmental psychologist psychoanalyst but I think what's interesting is that shouldn't maybe be the first point his story is very interesting he was a friend of Freud's daughter he was going through a lot of issues himself and so he his first approach to psychoanalysis was as a patient and he got so much out of it that he dedicated his life to becoming an uh, analyst himself Right, so at that point they wouldn't have called him a psychologist he was a psychoanalyst you were coming in and explaining your problems and he was analyzing telling what it meant and what to do so it's a very different thing than what we kind of think is kind of current 2020 counseling and to understand how it shifted we're gonna eventually get to some people like Carl Rogers and Carl Rogers had a huge influence on what later became client-centered or person-centered therapies and if you've ever worked at any organization that has the idea of person-centered or client-centered or focusing on where the person's at and building your treatment around that that's all a reflection of what's called Rogerian psychology which is just like the last name of Carl Rogers uh, Rogerian psychology and this idea of who you are is that there I think I might have already touched on this so I'm really sorry if I'm repeating myself um that he is that the most important thing as a, as a therapist is who you are and who you are in your relation with your with the person you're trying to help and that having like some super th smart advanced theory it's like that only has a chance to have tangible effect real effect if a relationship's been established and, and you already know that's true say you're say me and you are just friends you're going through a difficult breakup we go out to have a coffee to uh to help you talk about it or whatever and you can tell that I'm not really caring I'm not really listening I'm on my phone half the time it doesn't really matter if I give good advice you're not going to value that advice because you don't think I care so Rogers a lot of his uh applicable philosophy of how of what later becomes like especially for the individuals listening to this that are going to go the counseling route reading a book like on becoming it's just called on becoming by Carl Rogers is super important right because it's the it's the foundational philosophy for a lot of modern repackaging of kind of trendy things in psychology these core um foundational voices so Erickson's big idea and if if you're taking notes and I would I would suggest even though this is a digital lecture like still taking notes um, I'm obviously not gonna like check on you for that you're all adults you don't have to it's not that it's actually I, I talk about this a lot with my Conestoga students and I'll try not to say that every single slide but um, one thing I talk with them a lot about in the student success course I teach is how when you're taking notes you're actually engaging differently and it's it's the sensory motor engagement is actually making your experience of time faster so it'll feel like it goes faster you're, you're um, 
for this article i should i'll bring it up and present it at some point here but it's a significant it's almost a full letter grade difference if you take students that are relatively the same and one of the reasons is it's because to take active notes and to be it's just involving and demanding through behavior a higher level of cognitive attention so if i say people that take notes do better on tests it's not necessarily the taking notes it's the that the fact of or the act of taking notes demands a level of attention that increase in intention is probably what actually causes the grade difference right it's a kind of interesting unintended consequence but or in this case very intended consequence so the whole reason i started that little rant was to say that erickson's idea here of a psychosocial is his core notion and what that word means is that our psychology develops th throughout our exposure to our social world now he's he's not going just fully the nurture side of that debate i mentioned earlier because he's definitely still acknowledging that we that we're organisms we have internal drives he's a freudian at heart but he's very interested in how the development of our mind relates to our social world okay so he thought that humans develop through psychosocial stages you've heard some of these words if you've ever heard somebody say um this is just the classic like movie style example like oh this guy that i'm dating i won't try to do a girl's voice i don't know why i did that but this guy that i'm dating is uh trying to or i want to get married but he's not committing he has trust issues you may have heard someone use that term trust issues right and erickson would say well that's actually a very specific term that erickson kind of added to the common vocabulary to mean this idea that because of that individual's early relationship with his primary caregiver probably biological mom because that guy didn't learn that he could trust his mom because his mom was literally not responsive in a synchronous way to his needs as a child that his model of relationship at a core fundamental level is distrusting it's not trusting and that that's actually affecting him whatever 20 years later in his ability to commit in like a mature adult relationship so that's just i kind of freestyled that example but that's just an example of or you've heard of like an identity crisis so these are erickson ideas erickson really popularized the word identity right and so anyway so he's talking about how a lot of our motivation for development is social and that change occurs throughout the entire lifespan so what you'll notice when we start getting into specific age brackets um by the end by the time we get to christmas by the time we finish this component of the course like the um zero to 18 we're going to basically be done with freud now not completely but in terms of looking at stages of development erickson kind of building on freud and remember i wanted i don't want to say this too many times but i really want to hammer this idea that everyone after freud is either challenging or responding or building off freud um his influence on everyone coming after him is almost impossible to over exaggerate okay so that i already kind of explained this just verbally but an example of these stages so he says there's eight stages the first stage is trust versus mistrust i'm not going to go through them all here but just to give you an idea that this ability to establish trust early in life actually has effect on our ability to establish trust throughout life because these early relationships become a model not just of relationships but what relationship even is and think of what a model is what's a model plane it's not a plane it's something that's a representation of a plane and it's like this child builds a model of what relationships are supposed to be and then applies it in oftentimes painful ways as an adult in different situations now again that's going a little bit deep but um, if you're following me closely I, I think you probably got that okay so another example and this is i kind of just two different examples so these, these aren't in sequence because trust versus mistrust is like zero to two intimacy versus isolation is basically your 20s 
now this intimacy intimacy versus isolation thing is is super relevant in today's situation where isolation rates are at a level maybe never experienced at least in our own lives with all the lockdown stuff that mistrust experienced during early adulthood can cause difficulty forming intimate relationships later so how this early trust is actually affecting incredibly psychologically significant things later in life that's kind of a core idea that you're going to hear from freud and erickson right that's because they're both under this umbrella of psychoanalytic now in a second we're going to see the emergence of challengers to this right we're going to see the behavioralists come and say well i care a little bit less about your childhood and a little bit more how i can use rewards to shape your behavior and if i can observe and shape and predict your behavior then i understand you and a lot of this is just couch talk i think skinner literally said that right because freud also kind of invented this idea of like the somebody laying on a couch so couch talk is just kind of a rip of freud right like freud that's that's not that's just like bs freud stuff right because freud no i don't believe that at all i think that skinner is incredibly smart i think skinner is also incredibly complicated and i'll talk to you about it more when we get to him uh his involvement with the military in world war ii for example um and in using pigeons to direct missiles that you haven't maybe heard of project orcon o-r-c-o-n but I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there um but yeah th- a lot of people are going to come next and say it's not just these psychodynamics it's understanding behavior or it's understanding cognition or it's understanding genetics but i would recommend against throwing away the psychoanalytic idea and i think um one of my critiques of kind of of modern psychology is how quick they are to do it because it doesn't fit easily in again that's perhaps my bias okay next slide so i'm going to do this one pretty quick uh i could go on forever on piaget he was in john piaget was incredibly important in ending children working in factories in in england and making an argument that kids are actually not just small adults that they that their development is super important that they should be going to, to school that they should be put in situations that kind of help them along these what he called stages of cognitive development and we'll get all into this like sensory uh sensory motor meaning that, that i think i already mentioned this earlier but that a child basically is experiencing their world through their sense organs and through their movement pre-operational concrete operational formal operational and we'll get into the very specifics of what those ideas mean and if you're interested i kind of have little quick definitions there but basically the stages of cognitive development are exactly what it sounds like how how you go from everybody knows it's it just sounds almost silly to say that when you're 10 you're smarter than when you're two but what does that actually mean and how does that actually change and what are the stages of that development that cognitive development all right so i'm gonna just that's all i'm gonna do for this but um piaget again another person who's kind of known as a child psychologist and is a child psychologist for sure it, it, and should be known as that one of the most important top five for sure but at the same time somebody that wrote about a lot more than just that so a lot of you if you've taken so you're i I believe you're all in your the beginning of your second year so you might probably took like a psych 101 or whatever the equivalent of that is at nipsing um so my experience where i was trained and took my classes and all that was at university of waterloo and as you get going there's different kind of branches of psychology and one of the branches is cognitive psychology and i just wanted to do this real quick that when people when you hear the word cognitive um and you may already know this but basically it just means like the the work that your brain does right so we're talking about how your brain processes and uses language which is actually super complicated 
how you think and solve problems, how you access and the whole system of um, processing information, storing it and retrieving it, which we call memory, at how attention works. And in some ways, attention is one of the most interesting things about psychology, how much you're and because it's also the flip, it's not just what you pay attention to that's interesting. It's what's almost more interesting is what you don't notice. That you can't remember the color of the third last car you you passed last time you went for a drive. That your brain is actually incredibly good at knowing what doesn't matter. As a side note, that's also why you're more likely, if you're someone that drives a car, to accidentally hit a motorcycle than a car. Because your brain's not looking for a motorcycle. And that's why you'll sometimes see people that ride motorcycles ride in a way that, like kind of close to the center lane or whatever. Some of that is a recognition that they're often in people's blind spot. And so to make them more visible. And anyways, that's just a side note, but it's interesting. My point is that what you perceive and what you pay attention to and what you remember, all those kind of things are interesting. But the flip is also interesting what you don't and why you don't and how having a functional brain is actually dependent on you not noticing everything and not remembering every single thing. And that that actually wouldn't be as much of a mental boost as you might think. Well, I guess unless theoretically you could also give a massive boost to overall processing power. But again, the metaphor of the brain as a computer is useful for explaining certain concepts like memory, but has real limitations uh, when, when getting into certain dynamic levels and how emotion affects things and all those kind of things. But uh, the, the cognitive and time-wise is important, right? Computers are becoming huge. This is a uh, emerging in like the 50s, 60s, this idea of maybe we need to look at the brain as mechanistic, as machine like, as a computer. And I'll make this point later that the area where that makes the most sense is how is in relation to memory, the kind of processing storage and retrieval. OK. So the cognitive theorists like Piaget were interested in this idea of conscious thought. So they were less, a little bit less interested in your behavior or your you know, early experiences. Not that they were less interested, but that's not what they're focused on. They wanted to know on what was they wanted to know about what was going on between your ears, how you were making sense of your experience, how children construct personal understandings of situations. All right, and I can keep giving an example. I can give an example of that, like how. Well, you got two kids running around in the backyard. You got my my dot my daughter and maybe her cousin Harvey, and they're running around. They got sticks, and they're like, it looks like they're just doing nothing. But in their heads, they're like chasing dragons, and they're defending their fort, and they're in this whole made up world. And Piaget was really interested in that internal experience, that conscious thought of the young child. Piaget presents these age-related different stages. So he actually takes that question incredibly seriously. I kind of made it in uh, comment on it in passing a slide ago where everybody knows that a two-year-old and a 10-year-old, you wouldn't expect them to score the same on, an, on a test. But how do you, what are we, what's actually changing between two and 10? And so he put a lot of time into that and developed a stage model to, to look at that, that a child's cognition is qualitatively different in each stage so it's not just that they're getting better at certain things it's not like their amount of attention and their amount of ability to do math and their amount of ability to do words say you gave that all a 62 and then they get older and it's a 71 and then it's an 80 it's not that kind of scale doesn't almost make sense how they're processing information is almost a whole different way of doing it so we would call that a we went over this word a bit earlier but we would call that a qualitative difference. So these four stages that Piaget talked about, and I'll just go over these quick, I, I uh, just wanted to touch on them. 
and when we get to the relevant age range in future presentations I'll go in, in depth so I, I've kind of mentioned this already but the sensory motor stage and I, I know I've said this a bunch but I want this to kind of sink in this idea of really focus on the sensory motor that the child's experiencing the world mainly through their eyes their ears their nose their mouth their touch and through moving around so this is birth to approximately two infants construct an understanding of the world by coordinating sensory experiences that's a cool way it's a kind of a cool way of wording it that they're they're and, and i want to want you to kind of think deep about that for a sec that this emerging child's brain and their interacting with the world are directly connected this is what we call cognitive development when the child gets in this like two to seven range we call this pre-operational now to understand so we this operational is a specific type, type of word right so operational kind of means usable if you had a plan that you, you want to get into really good shape and this is your plan and it seems really un, unrealistic like you say you, you haven't worked out in a long time and your plan is to run 10 miles a day and do 100 push-ups before breakfast it's like and but you but you can only do three push-ups right now it's like that plan doesn't sound very operational it doesn't sound like you could take that plan and immediately start implementing it operationalizing it is another way to say that right but if you maybe your goal is you want to start doing a few push-ups off the wall and then when you start to feel a little bit more comfortable maybe you do a few push-ups off the stairs and you increase the angle a bit and eventually maybe you're doing one or two off the floor then you're doing five then you're doing eight that's an, that's a more operational plan that could actually work that probably would work if you just stayed committed to it So anyways, that was, uh, sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but that was just, I'm trying to just explain that term operational. So pre-operational, he says pre-operational. So this is like two to seven. The child's able to represent the world with a world with words, images, drawings. So their ability to express themselves increasing. All right, but they're still, so a preschool child, so like say like my daughter Evie, still lacks the ability to perform more complicated operations. So let me just go to the next slide and I'll give you a really specific example of what I mean. So I had said on the last slide I was going to give an example. So here we go. So what he calls actually the concrete stage. So now think about what that means. Like the kid's thinking is getting more structured. It's literally, he calls it, it's becoming more concrete. You start to see the emergence of logical thinking. So now we're at the age range of like 7 to 11 roughly. Kids start to understand things like conversion, and this is the example I was going to give. You could trick my daughter right now if you took, say you were sharing a, a juice with her, and you took more than your share, but you put hers in a really tall, thin glass. You're like, oh, you want the really tall, thin glass? And she doesn't realize that your small, short glass actually has way more liquid in it. Right, and that if you were to pour her tall, thin glass of water or juice or whatever into the small fat cup you'd see right away that the conversion so that's what conversion means that like changing how something's presented it's like how you could trick a kid that that tall glass has more in it than the small glass now as a kid gets older they're going to be less confused by that i hope i wasn't i hope that it was at least semi-clear okay and then formal operational so this is kind of when when we're starting to get towards more adult ways of processing the world so as the child's like in this 11 to 15 we start to see a further development of logical reasoning so what's logical reasoning well this makes sense because the things kind of line towards this ability to kind of well strain together logic and make a reasoned point this doesn't make sense because this 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 and this and that that what you said there actually makes sense you can think more abstractly right not just answer questions that you know the specific to but you can talk about truth and mind and even like for t today we've been talking incredibly abstractly about stuff like the unconscious mind we see the development of more systematic problem solving so again, this more formal operational. 
it's actually the abilities these cognitive abilities are now usable operational more systematic problem solving developing hypothesis about why a hypothesis is hypothesis is about why hypotheses i should say i don't know why that tripped me up so much about why something is happening and the way it is happening and then test that right so that's basically the scientific method right there but getting more logical so here's the term of the day the zone of proximal development okay um this is a uh, the idea of uh the first the emergence of the first russian psychologist that we've talked about um and, but it won't be the last russia has an interesting role in all this and i'm going to talk about it more when i talk about um skinner and, and pavlov but that those we don't often think of them in relation to the cold war but but i, I think I'll, I'll bring up some things that you may find interesting when we get to that point but this idea so this call this is from a guy uh Vakovsky. you don't have to worry about his last name but i want you to know this term the zone of proximal development so this is a, a more easy idea than that sounds what it really means so proximity means um when i'm talking like this the oh that might not work i was going to pull the mic close but say i pull the mic close to me the proximity between me and the mic is smaller than when i push it push it farther away so proximity is a word that means the distance between people what the zone of proximal development means is that if you're trying to teach someone something and you can model it model the appropriate next level you actually increase their ability to learn that so let me give you a specific example it's why you would have like reading buddies at school that sometimes the best way to teach a kid how to read isn't necessarily by having a really advanced adult show them how to read but having another kid who's just a little bit better than them at, at it because it's like that next step creating that reachable next step so what that's that idea is so what the kind of deeper idea here is is that we have things we're able to do and then there's this layer around that of things that if people helped us we would be able to do and then i guess theoretically there's things that are beyond our reach as represented in this in the image that you're looking at so would so if you're interested in getting into something like teaching or working with kids or coaching or anything like that you're living in that zbt you're living in that zone of proximal development that's your tool and we'll talk about more specifically what it is because it's like you have to first of all you have to get their attention then you have to model the appropriate next step and then you need to and it needs to be done in a way that is focused on who you're specifically trying to help and where they're at right but the idea is that if you can get this right and build the scaffolding so think about what that word means it's like when you see them building a new building and they build like kind of the um well scaffolding is the word but it's like almost like a steel shell around the building as they're building it up that's just like a temporary structure right it's like me helping you or training wheels would be an example of scaffolding for biking so the kids trying to learn how to ride the bike but you put on these training wheels so that they can actually experience biking before they could safely do it without the training wheels and that that actually helps them learn how to bike without training wheels faster so for your notes actually maybe in case if you want to write down this researcher's name so Vakovsky is how you say it um you'll need to know how to spell that i'm just joking students always that's a joke i've used like for 10 years in a row um but his idea is what's called social cultural cognitive theory which means if you relate to what we were just talking about that our ability to think is actually shaped by the people around us and they can have an effect on that and that culture and social interaction have an effect on cognitive development that they're actually that our cognitive development is inseparable you can't separate that from our social life and our cultural life that our cognitive development is learning to use the inventions of our society right like me and you didn't develop english 
it was a pre-existing tool. I know it's weird to think of language as a tool, but it actually it it's as much of a tool as anything is. It might be in some ways our most important tool. Cognitive development is, I already said this, but cognitive development is learning to use the inventions of society, language, ways of remembering things, even things like math. So roughly, like roughly 60, 70 years ago, as computers started to become more of a normal thing, and I, I, um, as personal computers and computers in general started to kind of be something that the, the masses were aware of, this idea of understanding the brain as a computer started to pick up steam. And I've touched on this, but I wanted to just give a more specific label to that um, subdivision of psychology. All right, so the term that we would give to this idea of this basically idea of making the metaphor of the brain as a computer is called information processing theory. And the way to think about that for like on a test is if you ever had like a multiple choice test, it's like information processing, even just that label sounds very computerish, right? That, like, that sounds like something you would hear about if someone's talking about, you know, how fast a laptop is or something. And so this is, and just, I was just saying that that's maybe a way of remembering that this is this idea of metaphorically understanding the brain as a computer. Individuals manipulate information, monitor it, strategize about it. It's very much looking at how we engage the world through an act of processing information, whether we're talking about visually, verbally, socially, whatever. The development, that they, they, they don't believe in the same kind of stage model that I was presenting about Ericsson. So again, I think, and you, you probably already know this, but it's not like psychologists agree on everything. And it's not like they don't, that it's one consensus based field. Of course it isn't. And I think what I'll do is I'll teach the course and I'll give opinion on things. But what I'll try to do is even if I'm giving a bit of my bias or opinion, I'll try to call myself on that. Because I think I don't want to be fake and act like I'm neutral to everything. I do have a bit of a bias towards some of the classics, like some of the, like the Carl Jung, but I also am a huge fan of Carl Rogers and, and, and his contribution to counseling and Viktor Frankl and Anna Freud and a lot of, and Mary Ainsworth and, and a lot of her work on attachments. So I think all these theories have something to say, but they're certainly not all equal. I think information processing theory is though an interesting way, especially once we get looking at memory and kind of specifically dealing with data style information, I think it's useful. I think it's less useful for talking about some of the really dynamic things like why we dream, for example. If you guys are interested in that topic, that's been like a huge interest of mine my entire life. And I think that whole topic of dreaming, because we definitely dreamt before we talked. I could have said that smarter, but we used, we experienced dreams before we were using language. Um, again, this is, that's drifting away from developmental psyche into evolutionary psychology, but that's another interest area of mine if, if people want me to touch on that as we go. Okay. So operant conditioning. You've heard me mention the name Skinner a few times. So this is his big idea. So if you wanted to add it to your notes, I think it's on the next slide, but Skinner is just S-K-I-N-N-E-R, B-F Skinner. His core, and remember conditioning is just another word for learning, how people learn and how people's learning is often associated with the consequences for it right so his idea here is like if you can if you're in the picture if you reward the rat for eating for doing something like if you reward it with food for pulling that lever it'll keep doing it but if you shock it for doing it it'll stop doing it so it's this idea of at a certain level what we learn is based on wh how we think others are going to respond to our behavior so he thought that this development results from our behaviors 
that so development so how we change throughout our life that that happens because our behaviors interact with our world and we get feedback from that some positive some negative and that shapes future behavior this idea is called behaviorism and operant conditioning sometimes i think later in the course we're going to talk about what's called classical conditioning and you've probably heard of that that's the idea that's pavlov and the idea of associations so operant conditioning is just a, a little bit more complicated idea than that but it's based on that development is seen so the changes that we go through are things that we can observe behaviorally and they're so skinner would say like give me any kid i can make them into a soldier or a doctor or a dentist it's all just about crafting the right developmental tasks and and the right what he would call schedule of rewards to create the right environmental so this is like going hard on the nurture side of nature nurture operant conditioning believes that behavior is a that the behavior consequences so you do something and then the consequences of that behavior like being rewarded or punished causes changes in the probability of that happening again so you all do well in the test i give you all a hundred dollars and then you do well on the next test and I give you $200 and you do well on the next test. It's like that reward, the function of the reward that I'm giving is to increase the likelihood of your performance later. If it doesn't do that, then we would say that that reward was not useful. If, I, if you all did well on the thing and I gave everybody $100 and then the next time everybody failed, I would say that was a, well, that was a not a valuable reward. It actually had a counter effect. So, and I kind of over went with that point, but the idea in behavioralism is whether or not something even is considered a reward or punishment is how it affects future behavior. A correct punishment that doesn't reduce behavior isn't in Skinner's language actually punishment. So this is one of these tricky things in psychology where we use a word in common speech more broadly and more vaguely and in psychology we use the word in sort of the same way but with a much more specific meaning right so say if my kid does something i don't like and i yell at her and then she just does the same thing again later in a strict behavioralism perspective that wouldn't be considered a punishment or at least an efficient effective punishment i should say i guess you could call that an ineffective or an ineffective punishment So to kind of finish today, uh, we just rounded the two hour mark. If you get, if you're still listening, these students are committed. I, I don't know if I can, I'm not going to make this three hours. I'm not going to just add stuff just to make it three hours. I think what I'm going to do every week is do the chapter presentation I've planned. And I think I'm going to aim at a little over two hours and then probably provide as we get going like a few articles every week or i think i might actually do some reaction style videos to videos that i want to show you but that i'm uh, not sure if i can copyright wise just embed them in these more official files like like the actual chapter powerpoints but what i think i'll do is plan on making a presentation that's a little over two hours and then a little bit of extra content um and that that maybe is a is a nice way of doing this so bandura the reason i said all that is because it just made me think that the actual original footage of bandura's experiments would be a good example of one of the things i might do a, a reaction video on so you know what i mean by reaction video right you've probably seen tons of them where i'll basically put the video on one side and i'll put myself on the other side film it like a quick video and uh and then you know okay so anyways bender's experiment what he did was he showed now this is really interesting time-wise because this is happening once at the same time that people especially in america are starting to get televisions in the house and they're starting to so there's this emerging argument of does seeing television violence make you more violent does i'll put that in 2020 language 
does playing Grand Theft Auto actually make young kids more aggressive? Or does it actually let them purge some of their aggressive energies? Because for most of human history, that's been how people thought of it, like the Freudian idea of catharsis, or even back in Roman times, the idea of the Colosseum was, you know, people, to control people, you need to give them their bread and you need to give them their circus. That's, that's an old, old Roman saying, right? People need bread and circus. The modern version of that is people need a full stomach and an iPad with a subscription to Netflix and whatever, right? It's like people need entertainment and food and then they tend to be less politically active and it's actually why the Romans spent so much money on things like the Colosseum where they would, yeah, they'd have the gladiators and all that, but it was so much more than that. They would have full-scale military naval battles. They would flood the entire Colosseum and have like full battles inside. Like the degree of the lengths they went to give their citizens basically violence-based entertainment because they thought that that actually calmed them. Right. So the, the reason I went on that long spiel is to just say that historically there's been a lot of people that thought actually exposure to violence almost like let you work through those emotions and made you less violent so people uh, again 2020 equivalent you go to the sports game you're cheering you're yelling you're screaming and you kind of spend a lot of that energy and then you go home and you're a more calm person at least that's the theory of catharsis right that's an old word that means doing something to express and work through kind of pent up emotion. So anyway, so Bandura, what he does is he says, okay, well, we're going to put these kids in a room with these kind of like clowns it's called the Bobo doll, like B-O-B-O -B -O doll. And it's just basically one of those punching clown dolls where if you punch it, it'll go down to the ground and come back up. And what he's trying to see though is, does what I show them before they go into that room affect them? So if I show them a video before they go play with that of another kid that's about their age that goes in and just kind of taps it on the head and says how are you and plays nicely with it will that affect how they play with it or if i show them a video of a kid like hitting it and being super aggressive to it will that affect how the kid then behaves i'll jump ahead and tell you the experiment it's one of the only ones you'll ever see like this where every single participant responded aggressively when being primed with aggression it's actually super interesting you the you'll almost never see a, a finding like that um and i don't think it should be surprising we know now that psychological priming is a very real thing Okay, so he was looking at how the environment so in this case with that priming like showing the video before how that affects behavior and how seeing this is so interesting and relevant in so many ways but how when you perform behavior it actually affects how you think about yourself especially if you don't notice that there's this complicated interconnection between our environment who we think we are as a person and how we think and and our behavior and that it almost, well, and you'll, you'll notice for kind of theoretical purpose here, purposes here, he's kind of separating who you are kind of as a psychological and a cognitive construct from what your behavior is. And saying, we need to notice that both those things are being influenced by the environment. And both those things are influencing the environment. And he actually called this, uh, the term he used, I don't know if I have it on this slide coming up, but is called reciprocal determinism. So if you think about what re reciprocal means, right now it's not very reciprocal, it's very one-sided, I'm just talking. But say if we were in a scenario where I called you on the phone and I said something and then you said something and then I said something, we'd say that's a reciprocal conversation. And determinism means like that because of how this affected this, it created this kind of determined outcome. So reciprocal determinism means well, it's basically a fancy way of saying why those arrows are pointed in both directions. They're both determining each other in a complex, what he called his social cognitive model.
And I hope I, I hope you don't. I don't know how I'm, I'm coming across to you, but now I'm like a couple hours deep. I'm like feeling way more relaxed and like we're like old friends. But I know this is still your first exposure to me. And I think one way I always teach at Conestoga is really focusing on this idea that to understand psychology, a big part of it is understanding the language and breaking down what the words mean. And then when you go to study later, it, your pegs are stronger, your memory pegs are stronger, your foundation is stronger. These cognitive processes are linked to our environment and our behavior. So ethological theory, so this is pretty interesting and this is linking to this idea that as human beings we're also members of the animal kingdom and we share a lot of survival-based instinct with that shared i don't want to say shared ancestors but the fact that human beings are members of the animal kingdom is a psychologically significant thing that actually studying the behavior of animals has a lot that it can teach us about humans that especially like for example i have there the idea of stress 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 is that behavior strongly influenced by biology or sorry, I used the word stress twice there, but in different contexts. It this idea stresses the idea that your behavior is influenced by all by biology. But what I was actually saying before is that an example of that is what we commonly call stress. Right? That like to, some of the best psychological research on stress has been by a guy named Robert Sapolsky, who actually was studying it in baboons who have basically the same heart as us. Well, not uh, enough so that they have, well, they experience the same, basically similar neurotoxins. The stress hormone cortisol affects them basically the same. That's what his research was focused on, how cortisol levels in your blood are actually highly linked to what we kind of feel as being stressed, the uh, biochemical component of it. This is looking at how there's these critical and sensitive periods. Why, for example, a child not learning language at certain points can be it can be so hard to make up for that later. It's almost like we're born programmed for certain things at certain times. And this is where sometimes it's easy to use examples of other animals that are less complicated than humans, like, for example, ducks. So if you take like a, a young baby duck and you separate it from its mother immediately, after a couple of days, after it's kind of missed that sensitive critical, you'd actually call this a critical period. So critical and sensitive periods basically means the same critical is just an even shorter amount of time. So say this duck, this this uh, duck that's born has like this two week period to to map and to uh, to kind of psychologically link to mom. And if you deny that bird that chance. It will never form that relationship with anything. But if you, you, it could form that relationship to you. Birds can do that. Uh, kind of funny story growing up. My grandpa lived on a farm, but we lived in like downtown Kitchener. And my brother had a, a pet chicken. So my brother had a pet chicken when it was like a little yellow chick. And it would follow him around town. Like we'd walk around and it would follow him. And it, he's probably the only person in downtown Kitchener with a pet chicken. And it's like it to it, if you could look at how it's psychologically experiencing my brother, it would be as mom. It it primed it. It's psychologically bonded. Linked. Right. So that's just an example of what, what a critical sensitive period is. It's like if, if, if that doesn't happen at a certain time, it doesn't happen. Or it happens with much greater difficulty in a much more um, maladaptive potentially way. This idea that specific time frames during which the presence or absence of certain experiences have long lasting effects on individuals. Okay, so okay, so we're in the home stretch now. I just want to kind of go over this last uh, model and then make a few kind of summary reflection points. So ecological theory, this is looking at how and again, I know we've touched a lot of theories, but my goal with this first presentation is to kind of do an overview of 
the main characters and the main uh, topics that we're going to be or theoretical perspectives that we're going to be drawing upon. And then we'll go into more deeper elaboration on how they relate to the specific life stages at developmental periods or whatever as we get going. OK, so e ecological theory and you think just think of what you think of when you hear the word eco. Right. So that's looking at the environment. This is kind of breaking down what specifically how we're influenced by our environment stresses the biological factors and emphasizes how that relates to environmental factors. So Bruff and Brimer, uh, Bruff and Brenner's ecological theory is looking at how our environmental systems influence development through these five layers. OK, so over the next five slides, what I'm going to do is break down the five layers. So just real quick, you see like the orange circle in the middle, then like the beige circle and then light blue and then yellow and then green. OK, and what we're going to do is look at how he's saying, like, actually, you're a person. And then you have like a, a micro system, smaller social world around you and then a kind of larger. There's a meso system and then there's this larger ecosystem and a larger macro system. And it's a fancy way of talking about it. But you already know this. It's like I, I don't you don't need me to tell you that you're closer with your best friend than you are with your casual acquaintance and you're closer with that casual acquaintance than you are with the clerk at the corner store. But you kind of like that person and you maybe would share a joke with them so you know them a lot more than like a classmate that you've never talked to but even them you'd be able to relate to about some things because you have some shared experience so you know them more than like a totally random person so what this is saying is that there's like your social world is complicated and layered and he's this uh, this theoretical perspective is just putting labels to those things and calling those like a micro meso echo macro system Right, micro meaning small, meso meaning in between, eco meaning um, like environmental and macro meaning like big level. So again, I know I said that real fast, but I'm going to do a slide here on on each of these: the micro system, the meso system, the ecosystem, the macro system, and then what's called the chrono system. Right, chrono being a, a Latin word meaning time. Right. So that this all exists in, within time. Right. So if I if you told me some story and I was like, oh, that story sounds out of order. Tell me it chronologically what that means. Chrono is the same beginning. It's actually a reference to a to a Roman god, but in their mythology. But what chronos means is time. OK. So the first of these is kind of easy to understand. It's called the micro system. So you could just think of this as like your most immediate social world right if i was to say okay and we say we dropped all this language and i was to ask any one of you individually can you explain to me your social network and the people you'd probably start with well like okay well there's like my family and my maybe my boyfriend or girlfriend my my buddies the people i maybe play sports with or or the people i play online games with or the people at my church or the people at my organization whatever right so this is going to be the the people that well, the setting in which the individual lives and their genetic makeup. So oftentimes what genetic makeup means that also oftentimes includes things like family, cousins, but also includes things like your peers at school. Um, but then when it says also their genetic makeup, it also means that like it's not all just nurture. And all of these layers, we're talking about nurture, meaning we're talking about how to understand you we need to understand how the environment's influencing you this idea of genetic makeup means there's also a recognition that we're each individuals with with unique biologies so it's just a little slipped in shout out to the nature side of the debate most inter direct interactions with social agents take place within the microsystem social agents again just within this model that's just what they call like other people you engage with in your life your contacts individual the individual is a passive recipient of experiences so one of my critiques of this model one of the reasons i don't overly love this model is i think it makes some sense in describing some things but i think it puts it really pushes this idea that you're basically the result of your environment more than i and while i don't think that's totally untrue I think there's a piece of that 
your a bit of your environment. Um, I tend to lead more towards a philosophical stance of individualism in that one of the most interesting things about humans is that they're individuals, that they're different, that they have agency. And what the word agency means is you're not just a passive person that your life is happening to you. You're a conscious decision-making decision making individual. All right, so anyways, that was, again, I, I should just say that's like my critique. That's my, my. So when you see here, so then the blue with the multi-directional arrows there, the darker blue is representing what is referred to as the meso system, kind of the in-between connecting system. It's saying these are the relations between the microsystems, right? So like I might be influenced by my parents and by my teacher, but my parents and my teacher might also have a relationship. So there's like, or, you know, me and my brother are both influenced by my parents, but we also influence each other. And my sister's influenced by my brother, but also by me and also by my parents. So it's like, meso system is just this recognition that it's like, it's not just the study of you, it's the study of you and the study of me and the study of everybody else. And that these are all kind of interconnected. Children of parents who rejected and neglected them may have difficulty developing positive relationships later. And this is the idea that effects that happen at one level will affect other levels of the meso system. And I actually quite, quite solidly agree with that point. I think that there's a lot of truth in that. So the next level, the next level of the system called the ecosystem. So now we're in the light blue. So this is kind of like the more broad social world, social settings where an individual doesn't have as much of an active role, right? You're maybe not, you, you know your neighbors maybe, or even just the, so that's kind of the, mo the most mm -hmm. close one. But then even just that we, every human being that's ever existed lived in a certain setting kind of legally and media wise, even though media would have obviously meant very different things in the past. And in most, for most humans, it meant the church um and social welfare for most people in history was the church also if there was any especially if you go back more than a hundred years or so um social welfare services in general is a relatively recent thing in anything other than a religious context and if you're interested in that i i took a really when i did my bachelor of social work back in like I got my bachelor of social work. I just thought I should say that because I know um, this is a psychology course. I tend after I did that, I worked for a social worker for uh, for about three or four years, and then kind of changed directions. And I, I'll, I'll maybe tell you why later. Um, nothing about social work because of uh, basically because of an eye injury I went through that knocked me off course for a good half year. Uh, but my eye is fine now. But I can tell that story at a different point if people are interested. But Yeah, sorry, I kind of lost my point right there, but I was just talking about how, oh yeah, how I took that class about how to understand social welfare in North America, you, we, it's really important to understand how it transitioned from a largely religious-based missionary practices of Europe, basically, right, and that what we now call social work actually has a lot of roots there, which is kind of interesting because there's not a lot of direct connection there necessarily now except really if you think about how a lot of things like soup kitchens and homeless shelters often are in places like churches right so that has been before we kind of had a had a more kind of what do we call it in canada like a social safety net the only thing that was that besides just general just like random people being benevolent would have been the the local religious establishment okay and then the just the last piece of this model you're probably getting sick of these circles but the last part of Brenner's model is just this idea that all this experiences you know we're all experiencing all these layers as we're actively living through them in time and so what he's saying, and, and you can see that that's pictures designed to give a, a third dimensional component to it, that 
it's not just um width and height it's also depth it's like that this circle is almost spinning through time and that he's calling that the chrono system the time system this pattern of environmental and life transitions over the life course these social historical circumstances and you might have guessed that's why i have that virus image there right it's like you're not going to have to explain to anyone in 2020 what, what this is a picture of because even though all of our social lives are completely different there's commonalities there's commonalities in our chrono system just because we're alive on earth at the same time i'll just let you read this quote all right whatever i'll read it if you deliberately plan on being less than you're capable of being then i warn you that you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life and that is a harsh harsh quote from one of the most important psychologists and uh there's a call in that quote to take responsibility even if you're in a rough situation sometimes maybe because you're in a rough situation and not because other people aren't to blame for things but because it's imperative to your psychological health it's key to moving forward to take personal responsibility and ownership and active engagement in constructing a healthy plan for you know whether we're talking about mental health or whatever healthy relationships healthy self-talk again my um background is more in the therapeutic psychologies so if i love developmental psychology too and i think they're, they're they go hand in hand um but like i've taught tons of courses on things like uh therapeutic counseling and i taught for probably eight years an intro to counseling course so a lot of and and uh, advanced therapeutic practice advanced therapeutic rec practices which is basically like um animal therapy and uh stuff like that but using more active forms of therapeutic engagement within uh to pursue rather traditional therapeutic goals okay so again if if you're not interested in that i'll, I'll keep that to a minimum but if people are finding certain things i'm ranting about interesting if you could even just shoot me a quick email and let me know uh that'd be super helpful to know uh my students a bit better okay so you've probably seen maslow's hierarchy of needs before and at different points we'll get into it and i think um i, I won't spend tons of time on it but basically this idea that what we need isn't all equal it's actually a hierarchy which is just a word that means like some things are more important than others your need for food is more important than your need to be liked by your peers they both might be important but they're not the same right so and you can see in the, sh the shading here these deficiency needs so he says like these are the needs that if you don't have enough of you'll experience psychological harm and it's or uh, or a lack of psychological optimization but once those deficiency needs are met then we can talk about some of this further self-actualization kind of stuff and i think it's important to note that maslow's work is being presented as a reaction to both the psychoanalytic and behavioral approaches that came before it so both a reaction to freud who basically was saying that like and again this is not a uh full representation of freud but the critique is that he's like kind of too focused on early life experiences and then the critique of behavioralism would be that they're too focused on like viewing humans as just smarter animals that are just manipulatable by controlling our rewards and punishments and saying that there's actually something more than that that we're actually human beings and there's something important about being a human being so again i'm just kind of stressing that to explain why we call this the humanist approach and two huge people in this are, are people i've already been referencing today maslow and, and carl rogers who earlier i said is probably the person that affected what you consider to be counseling more than anybody else 
they had a holistic approach. They, they actually thought that if people could be put in a healthy situation that we actually have within us, which is within us is just another way of saying intrinsic. We have this motivation within us to get better. And that a lot of times we get set up into and get engaged in and trapped in patterns of behavior and stuff that are, are almost preventing us from being what we could be if we weren't being shackled in that way. That people actually want to be better. Maslow well believe that the most kind of fundamental thing here, and I'm just going to, I know I said I was just going to touch on this, but I want to kind of explain the model quickly and then and then sum up stuff for today. So Maslow focused on this idea of physiological, so physical needs as being fundamental for survival. Our bodies innately try to balance these things. He called that homeostasis, right? That when we feel cold, we want to put on a sweater. When we feel thirsty, we have urges to drink. Uh, when we feel hungry to eat, when we feel, he would say the need to reproduce, right, would be on that list. So that list would include like eating, drinking, sexual activity, sleep, even things like going to the bathroom is a physiological need. Um, and how you know that is because if in some kind of intensely tragic situation, if somebody was prevented from doing that, they would eventually die from blood poisoning. So it's absolutely a need. A uh, need to reproduce is physiological. So an interesting kind of focus point when looking at this model is the difference between deficiency needs and growth needs. So Maslow kind of divided these into two different categories and deficiency needs or D needs, whatever, we don't necessarily need to shorten it, includes levels one to four so basically the ones that are being shaded there light blue so this is like your physiological your safety needs your needs for belonging and love interesting research there uh by harry ha harlow and with his monkeys and we'll talk about that later and then esteem needs so basically what he's saying is these needs need to be addressed before we're even talking about any of these kind of higher needs and that if they're not people actually are more vulnerable to the psychological unrest of things like anxiety and depression so it, this is an important point that he thought that it's not even if somebody's like unsure where their next meal is coming from and doesn't feel safe at home and feels like no one cares about them talking about like improving their self-actualization and becoming their true self it's like that's so many levels ahead of where they're at right that this is this needs to, and this is why he's saying it's like a hierarchy. It needs to be understood that there's a progressive nature to this. Oh, if you're still watching, you're hardcore dedicated. We're rounded two and a half hours. Sorry, I thought this would be a little bit shorter, but positive psychology is this last branch. Oh, basically I have two, this and, and then dynamic system theory, and then I'll make a few final points. Okay, so this slide, one more, then a few final points. Positive psychology, and this is largely based on the work of a guy named Dr. Uh, Martin Sliegman and his ideas of called what's called learned optimism, which we'll talk about. And he was looking at this idea of, okay, what's positive psychology mean? Well, for most of the history of psychology, there was kind of this idea that there's something wrong with someone that's, for whatever reason, made them kind of less than normal. So what I mean by that is let's just you were talking like a thermometer and we have a temperature of zero and it's like somebody's experiencing something negative maybe they dip i'm just making this up maybe they dip to like a negative 10 and your goal as a therapist is to bring them back up to zero back up to normal and what positive psychology is teaching is maybe that shouldn't be the goal maybe the goal should be to actually bring people up past normal and actually promote even healthier types of lifestyles and that maybe psychology is not just focused on Well, what even 20 years ago would have been called abnormal psychology, not normal things. So when, when things are a problem, how to get it back to normal. Sligman's idea is like psychology can actually do a lot more than that. A lot of these principles can actually be learned to help you optimize. And he used this metaphor of PERMA, 
Okay, so it's just an acronym. So he says, okay, number one, we can improve our lives by actively doing things that increase the amount of positive emotion. That actually staying optimistic isn't just flowery thinking. It's actually functional and it actually is performance related. And we know that by just looking at the flip. We know that when you're anxious and depressed and, and negative, you think you have less fluidity of thought. You have less fluidity of vocabulary. You're actually cognitively functioning at a weaker level. So he's saying, you know, to reach towards these higher levels of positive psychology, we need to develop positive emotion. We need to be engaged. I've made this point for a long time that like one of the most important th things here is that well, one of the biggest things to fight against some of the negative in our life right now is to find things you're interested in because that act of being interested in it doesn't matter if you're watching for me it's like I love animal videos and videos about outer space it's like they're not necessarily practical for me to watch but when I'm interested that interest that state of fascination itself is therapeutic. You know, developing therapeutic influence through healthy relationships, connecting with people and groups that activate us in a positive way, adding meaning into our life. And this can be religious or spiritual or through volunteering or through your hobbies or the more that people feel like what they're doing has a purpose or I should say that differently, feeling like what you're doing has a purpose is directly connected with positive outcomes and all kinds of things related to psychological well-being. And then this idea that accomplishment and achievement and actually setting ourselves up. So this is it's a little bit different with, with some of you at, at Nipissing. With my Conestoga students, it's the program that I teach there is a lot of times students maybe didn't have the best experience in high school and they're taking this one year academic upgrading programs so that then they can apply to either like policing or firefighting or social work or anything that we call kind of human services at Conestoga. And so I'm constantly talking about this idea of how you develop into a good student is by learning how to set realistic goals that are actually achievable. And you probably heard about smart goals, like make your, your goals uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. And if you do that, the actual likelihood of you statistic the statistical likelihood of you actually achieving that goal goes way up. So the example I used with my other students the other day was like, if I'm just like, I'm going to try to use social media less, and that's my goal. There's an, that's going to have very little effect on my behavior. But if my goal is very specifically while I'm doing this presentation, I want to only check my phone two times or less, I might actually do that. The more specific, measurable. Uh, achievable, realistic, and times uh, bound, time bound, time restricted, whatever a goal is, the more likely you're actually to achieve it. And that starting to achieve little things can actually fight against a lot of where a lot of uh, depressed and negative thinking is set in this idea of like, I can't do anything right. And one of the best ways to combat that thinking is actually through examples of you doing things right, of accomplishment. There's no fake way to improve self-esteem and confidence as much as real valued accomplishment changes those things. So before doing a quick summary of today, I just wanted to touch this one last uh, Thelion's idea of like a dynamic system theory or this idea of we can't just look at psychology as just stuff going on in our head that actually we're we have a very physical experience and we need to understand how that plays a role here and that our learning is says they're connected firmly to that physical experience, that we're self-organization is like an important thing of understanding what human beings are as creatures, that it's this interaction between our nervous system, our body, the environment, when we're trying to organize and make sense of the world, allows, this is what allows us to develop in a more spontaneous and novel ways. This is a way of looking at development as complex and being linked with experience. So this is kind of a way of saying it's nature and nurture that it's like, yeah, it's you're being shaped by your world, but there's something that the world is shaping. And that's what we call nature, you. And that actually there's these 
this is an awesome term from this theory, phase transitions. That there's actually times when, and I know right now with how the world is, it might be hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we very well may be in a phase transition where some of the instability and turbulence that we're experiencing is actually going to lead to new, more advanced levels of complexity. And that that's not, even though it feels very unsettling right now, that's all humans do. Ever since our earliest ancestors were alive, we've been evolving to new situations and learning how to survive and learning how to thrive in new challenges. You're strong. Your ancestors were strong. Your ancestors are way more than just your parents. I'm talking about thousands of generations of people who who are our lineage as human beings, our shared fathers and mothers. Okay, so we're closing in almost three hours. Oh man, this I hope this was wasn't too painful for, for the students, but I want to just do this real quick. So this is just my kind of ending to summarize what I've been talking about these last almost three hours with kind of 16 main ideas from chapter one. All right, and I'll just kind of hammer through these. I, I won't uh, go too ranty on any of these, but number one, that development is a pattern of change that starts with conception and goes throughout the entire lifespan. It include, includes both growth and decline. So it can be growth in terms of like how we get taller as we get older to a certain point. It can be decline when we're looking at something like cognitive decline, like Alzheimer's. Number two, development is constructed through biological, social, cultural, so society and culture, and individual factors working together. It's kind of a, there's a lot of consensus that this kind of nature nurture debate is maybe useful as a theoretical talking point to break down and look at stuff, but really everything is some complicated connection of biology and environment and your individual factors, your agency, the fact that you're a decision-making individual like I was kind of talking about before. We've seen this dramatic increase of life expectancy that's peaked interest in development during later adulthood. There's just way more people now that are living into their 80s and 90s. Three key developmental processes, biological, cognitive, and social emotional. And when we're talking about development, we're really talking about the interplay of those things, those processes. Okay, number five is just to review those seven uh, defined periods we talked about earlier. The lifespan is commonly divided into prenatal, infancy, early childhood, middle and late childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, middle adulthood, late adulthood. That's actually one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. They just split middle and late up. We often think of age only in chronological terms, but full evaluation of age also requires or uh, requires consideration of things like biological age, psychological age, social age. We talked about that right near the beginning. Three uh, pathways of aging are pathological, normal, and successful. Those are terms we covered earlier. In research covering adolescence through late adulthood, Many, but not all studies find that older adults report the highest levels of life satisfaction. I think that's a point that we're gonna spend a bunch of time in on in the winter version of the course, all right? Looking at this idea that, well, how we can maximize life satisfaction when we're older. And uh, some of the research around that's actually quite interesting. Three important issues in the study of development are, and these are important issues because they're, they're ways of talking about so many things this idea of nature nurture this idea of continuity 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 and discontinuity i always get mixed up with that because it's just the word continue but it's said differently it means like why do some things stay the same and why do some things change and i just kind of said stability change those are highly related according to psychoanalytic uh, theories including those of freud and erickson development primarily depends on the unconscious mind and is heavily couched in emotion. We're way more emotionally driven than we'd like to think. We'd like to think that we're very cognitively driven. The psychoanalysts challenge that. I know I'm just kind of reading these, but these are just some summary points. 
Number 11, we then moved, to, moved on to the cognitive theorists. We looked at how that emphasizes thinking, reasoning, language, other cognitive processes. The three main people we looked at were Piaget, or the theories, I should say, uh, Piaget's, which was the stages of cognitive development, Vygotsky's zonal proximal development, and then the information processing idea of looking at the brain like a computer. 12, behavioral and social cognitive theories emphasize the environment's role in development. Two people that we looked at today that talked about that were Skinner and Bandura. The ethological theory of Lorenz really focuses on this idea of biology and evolutionary basis of development. So this is where I was saying like the link to the animal kingdom. And then just a couple more here. According to Brof and Brimer's biological or bioecological theory, so this is the one we looked at with all the circles, development is predominantly reflected through the influence of those five systems, micro, meso, eco, macro, and chrono. So again, chrono meaning time, all those other ones just meaning your social world has these different layers of complexity, some influencing you more than others. Number 15, according to the humanist approach, individuals are motivated towards self-improvement two key humanists are Carl Rogers and Maslow. Other ones are uh, like Viktor Frankl, hugely important. And then lastly, in this course, we're kind of going to be taking what you could consider an, an eclectic to a certain point. Look at this. And uh, I think there's some limitations to that because I think it's easy to just cherry pick ideas from everywhere and have a theory that's a lot of paste together stuff, but not necessarily can internally consistent logically but i think what i mean by this here because eclectic just means like we're pulling from everywhere sometimes it makes more sense for some things so for example maslow and carl rogers when we're talking about things like as an adult how do we develop um intimacy and and a sense of identity and stuff those people make a lot of sense there Broff and Brenner would make sense a lot if we're looking at how like school affects a kid or maybe we're talking about Piaget then. So a lot of this stuff's going to be applied situationally depending on topic and age range uh, that we're looking at. Survive the first presentation. Thanks for watching. I hope that uh, wasn't too painful. And uh, if you have little suggestions for me that aren't too... Uh... <laughs> I'm still trying to build my confidence here being a digital presenter so please don't be too too rough but uh even if it's if you just want to say like it'd be interesting if i went a little more into certain things or whatever i'd love to hear from you and uh now that i got this done i think as i get into later thursday i want to get back to all of your emails because uh some of you wrote really nice things and i i just want to uh give it the proper time and not just give a rushed response so anyways more information coming soon i know that people are itching to know um because I, I've been experimenting a bit with what I want to do in terms of testing and in a way that is not overly burdensome to you, but still fair and stuff, I've just, I need a couple, another day or two to get the course outline out and to get some updates around how I'm going to do that. Because I just don't want to force out a plan and then have to change it immediately once I realize I should be doing something else. I got to do all the respondus that you guys use at Nipissing. It's new to me, but I got to do all that training tomorrow. So anyways, the information's coming soon. I'm not going to make the test crazy. Um, the, the tests are more just um, quizzes. And then we're going to do a few assignments and stuff. And I know that as students, you're at the beginning of the term, you're probably really thinking about when things are and when things are due and all that kind of stuff. And I, I will be bringing a lot of clarity to that soon. I just want to approach you with a well-constructed plan that's going to be stable for the whole term. And I just need a couple more days. All right. So uh, I've loved the the amount of interaction we've had so far. If you need anything, please reach out. And uh, I apologize again for the length. This is going to be almost three hours. But I almost said take care. I love you guys. It's like I, I don't even know you guys. But um, there's something about this course that connects people because we're I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about all of us at the same time and that's kind of what's cool about psychology so i hope you got something out of that and uh stay positive call a friend that you maybe haven't talked to for a while that you think might you know need to hear a friendly voice and 
just be a good person. It's that's all that the world's asking. I think I don't need to get preachy at the end. Anyways, have a great week and take care.